If you're looking for inspiration on a monumental scale, then stay tuned for this video because it's coming up. Thanks for tuning in today. What you're going to see in this video is a presentation given by the brilliant filmmaker, documentarian, promoter of all good things, John D. Liu. This is a presentation that John gave at the Permaculture Voices 2 conference, which I hosted back in March of 2015. What this presentation is, it's video that John made and John talking. John recorded all this video throughout his years of experience in the field. He edited it together in a presentation and then he talked over it live. That video and that talk spliced together is what you're gonna see coming up. It's an amazing amount of inspiration delivered in this 45 minutes. Here it is with John D. Lou. So it's great to be in a place where I'm not the only one with a beard or a hat. So, so thank you very much. I'm feeling right at home. Now when I push this button, it's going to be 45 minutes. I just pushed the button. So there's no... No going back for me, I have to keep up. I'm gonna talk about the great work of our time. And I definitely, the, the, the foundation that I work with, the Common Land, Land Foundation, they, uh, they tell me that I always preach to the converted. But I think what we're doing here is building collective consciousness. So I direct the Environmental Education Media Project, I work with the Common Land Foundation, and I have a visiting research fellowship with the Netherlands Institute of Ecology. So I'm also very thankful to everyone who's invited me here. Uh, Grant actually got me here, and my family got me here, but uh, also over the last 20 years, many different organizations have supported me to continue to do this research. And I'm on a, a kind of a personal journey. And uh, somebody interviewed me today, and I told him that I had gone overseas when I was about 27 years old. And I worked with CBS News. I helped to start the CBS News Bureau in China at the time of normalization of relations between China and the United States. And I, I watched many stories like the rise of China from poverty and isolation and the Tiananmen tragedy and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So for quite a long time, I was engaged in looking at geopolitical events. And then something strange happened. And the reason that I'm here is because in 1995, the World Bank asked me to film in Northwest China. This is high in the Himalayas, what I found was that there was a river that was once called the Mother River. And it was called the Mother River because all the different tribes emerged there. So you had Kazakhs and Mongols and Kyrgyz, and you had Han. And the Han were especially good at cooking. So I think they, they became the dominant species because their restaurants went everywhere, you know. And then, um, now... This place is called the Lus Plateau, and it's called the Lus Plateau because it's, there, it's not everywhere, so, so it's okay. It's not everywhere. Okay. So you, you, maybe you'll hear it in a moment when he's okay. digging. So it, Lus is, is a, a geomorphological name for this soil type, and it's a, it's a powdery soil, which is mineral soil, which is created by the movements of glaciers in the Himalayas, and it's deposited by wind on the uh, plateau below. And it's, if it has organic material, it's extremely fertile because it's a really rich mineral soil. Now, this guy is digging there, and if you dig around in this stuff, 
you might find some interesting things because this is also the cradle of Chinese civilization. So this is the birthplace of the most populous ethnic group on the planet. And this is to the southwest, and it's a fully functional forested system in Sichuan. And if you go to the northeast, then you find a fully functional grassland ecosystem in Mongolia. And it's between this, these systems, and it suggests that the Chinese race emerged in an area very similar to the Rift Valley, a mixed forest and grassland system. Now, there's evidence, according to the Chinese, of humans and their ancestors for a million and a half years. That's compared to five million years in the Rift Valley. And this is generally believed to be the second place on Earth after Mesopotamia where settled agriculture began. So this place gave birth to my ancestors and to the largest ethnic group on the planet. But in 1995, when I went there, it was a fundamentally degraded ecosystem. So it had essentially lost all of its vegetation cover. And so you could stand on a mountain and look in 360 degrees and there would be virtually no vegetative cover. But you see all these gullies and those gullies are evidence of water because this is caused by erosion. And so you see every, every watershed looks like the beginning of the Grand Canyon. And in 2009, I made a film called Hope in a Changing Climate, and immediately Alan Savory called me. And he said, you have to rethink your ideas about animals. And I said, okay, tell me about it. But what we saw here was a place that had been totally devegetated, and the people were in a cycle of poverty and ecological degradation. So the more they tried to produce with unsustainable agricultural methods, the worse the situation became. So they passed poverty from generation to generation. They taught the same methods, and they became poorer and poorer. Now, what's interesting about this is every cradle of civilization on the planet went pretty much in the same way. So this isn't simply the study of Chinese history. This is the study of human history and how certain human behaviors cause massive ecological damage. So I was sent there in 1995 to, to do this. It was a two-week assignment, I think. And I just became obsessed. And this has taken over my life now. Now, if, they, if it just stopped with degradation, it would be a sad story. But in fact the Chinese decided to restore the Lus Plateau. So they did this in a grand way. They engaged the entire population. They had three years of scientific study looking at all aspects of ecology in order to make a kind of master plan. Imagine a permaculture design system that covers 35,000 square kilometers. And then they use participatory assessment to engage the local people, and sometimes that didn't work very well, so they used another method, they paid them. That did work pretty well. 
And so what they did was they took people who were using Neolithic agricultural methods and they paid them to learn new, more sustainable agricultural methods and they subsidized the restoration through different types of, this is terracing, but this was not a terracing project. Terracing was one aspect of this project. So they, they worked on infiltration and retention of rainfall through many methods. They worked on revegetation, and they, they did something very important. They differentiated between ecological and economic land. So one of the things that is happening in many places is all the land is considered economic, and there's no room for nature. And so by designating some of the land as ecological land, they were able to release areas. And this had an enormous effect because gradually they, I mean, what I've seen here and in other places is that this place was dehydrated. I think you need some sound. Is my sound? Yeah. So, well, it's, it doesn't matter because he's speaking the goal Chinese. Was you want to give a hat to the hilltops, give he's, a belt to the hills, as well as shoes at the base. Oh, he's speaking English. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built he's to be used hat, for crop planting and also for and trees. Shoes. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy, as well as our lives, could improve. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. This is 1995. This is 2009. This next one is the even more dramatic. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. So essentially, what we're seeing is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale degraded ecosystems, including large-scale ecosystems that have been degraded over historical time. And that when you do this, you're returning basic ecological function so that you're rehydrating dehydrated biomes and you're restoring microclimates, microbiology when you listen to uh, Elaine Ingham, what you're doing is you're bringing back the microbial communities, the fungi communities, when you listen to Paul Stamets, and the natural functionality, that's going to give a, a vegetative cover, a canopy, microclimates, it's going to change everything. And I wondered, you know, is China special? And that's the only place you can do this? Chinese are intelligent and hardworking. They have a strong authoritarian government. But, uh, but can you do this, this elsewhere? And also I began to wonder, because I became so obsessed with this, that now I've been studying it for 20 years. And... I became rather philosophical about this. And I started considering how the earth formed. And I realized that the earth was a molten rock surrounded by poisonous gases. And over prodigious time, it was transformed into a beautiful garden. And 
This is interesting because in the religious cosmologies, it tells us human beings emerged in paradise. And if you consider evolution in this way, it says human beings emerged in paradise. There is no difference. And what you found in the climax systems is massive organic materials and massive diversity. And what you see is that this created the atmosphere, regulated the climate, created soil fertility, and naturally regulated the hydrological cycle. And so, you know, I thought, well, I'm a, I'm a television cameraman, a hippie dropout cameraman, so nobody's going to believe me. But they've invited me twice to the Royal Society in London. The Royal, the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences in Stockholm, where they give out the Nobel Prize, and to the Royal Academy of Arts and Sciences in the Netherlands. And science doesn't dispute this. And now all the conventions, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention on Combating Desertification, and the Ramsar Convention, all incorporate the concept that we can restore large-scale damaged ecosystems. So there's been a major shift that's taken place in science and in policy over, over time. I also saw that human beings' evolution has emerged. And about 35 to 40,000 years ago, we became very good hunters. And we hunted some large megafauna to extinction. But then we learned how to do slash and burn agriculture, and we massively began to alter the, the landscapes. And in doing this, we started a process which inevitably reduces, as long as you have these sort of Neolithic agricultural practices. So if I look at industrial agriculture, I just see a Neanderthal with a sharpened stick but he's got mechanization. So if you use these techniques, I can tell you exactly what's going to happen to the microbiologic communities, to the hydrological cycle, to weather and climate regulation. It's what destroys natural ecosystems and what collapses civilizations, and we're there. So humanity at this point, when we're at the point where we're altering the atmosphere, we're altering natural climate regulation, we're at a point where it's, it's, it's serious, it's critical. And so I found it wasn't only the Chinese. Every civilization that did this ended up exactly the same. So if you dehydrate and devegetate, and reduce biodiversity, you're going to end up in the same situation. And when I analyze what's going on today, I see that we're not taking these things into consideration. So I started getting fellowships when I started talking like this, and uh, that was nice because I could interact with scientists, and I've, I've been able to work with many of the top scientists all around the world. And... In 2006, I was told to go to Africa. And uh, the director of the uh, Rothamsted Research Institute said, go to Africa. So I went to Africa. When I went to Rwanda, I was able to speak. Many things that I've seen in Rwanda remind me of some of the things that I've seen in China. The Chinese government was asking this generation and all the generations alive today to change the course of human history, to take those denuded, the denuded landscape that they, they had and somehow alter this. Less beards and hats. This, this is a letter that says thank you for coming and sharing this information. That's nice. This is a letter that says we, we believe you 
we're going to rewrite the land use policy laws for the country linking economic development to ecological function. That was eight years ago. There's eight years of data. It's are giving ourselves maybe three years of growth so that by 2020 we have 30% of actually forested area. So it's now did an aggressive campaign across the country to restore destroyed forests. There has been a lot of restoration that has been carried out uh, relating to our environment. And we've seen that restoration grow from year to another year. We have an, a target of increasing our electricity generation. Today we are at uh, about 97 megawatts, and we want to increase that to 1,000 megawatts in the next eight years. Uh, and we are targeting that about 80% or so of that source of energy should be renewable energy, mainly from hydropower uh, electricity and from geothermal. So from 2014, we want to be producing any electricity from fossil fuels. Because as individual smallholders, they have no hope of accessing markets at all. So we've, we, we took up the policy of land conservation to ensure that. And we've been successful at that. It, we started it four years ago, and we have, we, we as Rwanda now, today we are very proud to say we are food secure. We've been growing at an average of 8.2%. And we've seen more than 1 million people of population lifted out of poverty in the last five years. That's 12% of our, of our population. I don't know if you could hear that. You could? 8.2% economic growth over the last five years in a global depression. And they're emerging from genocide in the 1990s. So it's also interesting, they're getting back their hydrological resources, which is important because they're the headwaters of the White Nile and the Congo rivers. So this will have continental impacts. And we've achieved this within this mode of growth that caters for environment as well. So Rwanda is one place where I saw it's not just China where this is possible. It's possible wherever you, you try this, but definitely human beings emerged in paradise. And after I, after I began to study this, I saw I'm looking at dysfunction. I'm looking at dysfunctional systems. And all the scientists I'm talking to are studying dysfunction. And I'm tired of it. It's making me unhappy. And I decided to look at functional systems. This is the Andrews Experimental Forest along the McKinsey River in Oregon. And it's... It's covered with biodiversity. It has huge amounts of organic matter. You're, it's like walking on a giant carpet. It's wonderful. And if you go to Guyana, you can see a proto-Amazonian rainforest. If you go to the Mata Atlantica, you can see remnants of, of beautiful forests. If you go into the Congo Basin, you go to the eastern step of Mongolia, and now I've been to 80 countries around the world looking at ecosystems. There's nothing wrong with the earth. Human beings, however, have a lot of problems. And what we really need to understand is that in any of these systems, we need to understand that they are functional and what we've been doing is we've been forcing them to be productive, but it turns out 
that productivity follows function. Often we're asking, can we increase productivity? I think the question should be, can we increase function? Because if we increase the ecological function, the productivity will take care of itself. But if we push the system for productivity, in all of historical time, this has caused massive disruptions to ecological function. So I think we need to sort of rethink this. And this also started me to think about, well, wait a minute. These are functional systems. Human beings emerged in paradise. But then we sinned. So I don't understand the apple and the snake part exactly. But if it's a poetic metaphor and not literal, I think I know what original sin is. I think original sin is the reduction of biodiversity. Because if you reduce biodiversity, you reduce biomass. If you reduce biomass, you reduce the accumulation of organic materials. This alters gas exchange, which means we have reduced photosynthesis. We're not absorbing as much carbon. We're not emitting as much oxygen. It massively changes nutrient recycling and nutrient release, and it horribly disrupts the natural hydrological cycle, which is the natural regulation of weather and climate. And so everything that we're seeing is not an accident, it's an outcome. And it's illogical, and we can understand it. Even a hippie cameraman can understand it. So it's, it's interesting when you present it in this way, because it's irrefutable. You can take it into the scientific arena, and you can say, well, am I wrong? And they have to say, no, you're right. This is what's happening. And then I realized we've made a mistake. Ecological function is the basis of wealth, but we've said that productivity and trade was the basis of wealth. But it's not true. Because if you're doing trade, you need infinite growth. But you can't have infinite growth with finite resources. It's an impossibility. And so you have this sort of perverse situation. And you're actually causing things to fall apart instead of having supporting an eternal living system. So we've valued scarcity above abundance. This is a huge mistake. And the way to correct this is to realize that money is not based on production and consumption of goods and services. Money and wealth is based on ecological function. And if we do that, all human effort will go to restoring the natural ecological systems on the planet. And that's what we need in order to ensure that we can survive and become sustainable. So I call this the great work of our time. We need new economic models. There are many, but I think we need to, to meditate on them. One that our, our uh, foundation, Common Land Foundation, is working on is called the Four Returns Model which is based on large-scale ecological restoration. And it's a return of inspiration, meaning in our lives. It's a return of social capital. It's a return of natural capital. And from these, a return on investment. So that's one thing. I think you need audio because my, my friend, Willem. I only know that we have to work fast to get a, a, a model ready for companies, investors, and, and, and states, governments, to restore landscapes.
So what I propose is that we go to a system where we have four returns per hectare. And, and that a financial return or an investment return is a logical thing. But there are other three returns. The return of natural capital or the return of nature, you could say, here. The return of jobs, very important because we are talking about people who, are, who want to work or need work and want to live well. But maybe the most important is return of inspirational capital or return of inspiration. If you bring the return of inspiration back in the landscape, it will also will bring back a return of meaningfulness in people themselves. This is some of the things that are possible. This is dune stabilization. It's just taking straw and burying the straw, and then any water, 25 millimeters, 50 millimeters, whatever it is, will infiltrate. Bacteria will come up. Birds will, will leave their droppings or seeds will blow up, and it will revegetate even in sand. So imagine if we were to actively do this. How many people? There are 50% youth unemployment in Spain and Portugal. We have to do this kind of thing. What kind of thing are we thinking that we're going to be stuck in traffic going to a cubicle to do something. You know, we, we have to do real work. Work. I don't have a job. But I've got a lot of work. And it's possible to grow soils. It's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes. It's possible to use methods which are being discussed here, I, I, I've heard them, to have diverse cropping systems which are sustainable. Those industrial agriculture, this is Rene Holler, by the way, if you get a chance to look into his work, he's like Yoda. He can take these. The most run. important thing is to, as fast as possible, get vegetations, uh, vegetation to grow, and uh, that can be again uh, done in in very adverse areas. So, he's he's. Uh, really what happened now? There's hardly a place in these quarries down there which has no vegetation. There's grass, there's trees, everything. Before, you know, it was uh, two and a half square kilometers of of, of desert. He's special. <laughs> but there are many techniques. And all over the world, there are people who are looking into this. And if we apply the knowledge that we have now, and we make this the intention of society, then we will get a completely different result than we have now. Now it seems like whoever dies with the most stuff wins. Well... That's pointless. Future generations are going to have nothing. And if we want them to have something, we're going to have to take on this task. This is what our, all the generations who are alive today must make this change in order for future generations to have a chance. Otherwise, we're in, in terrible shape. And we need to discuss and to see that this is where the real value is. And right now, there's no economic um, incentives to do these things. It's a, it's a painful thing to take on this stuff now because the society and the economy values production and consumption higher than it does ecological function. But if we reach critical mass of collective consciousness to understand that wealth comes from ecological function, the, sy the system will change. It must change. And critical mass is not a majority. This is a flat earth, round earth situation. The church can say that the earth is flat and never mind Copernicus or Galileo or something, but 
eventually, no one is going to believe them anymore. And this is where we are. It's like the end of slavery. Slavery was legal. You can't defend slavery now. The earth is not flat. The earth is round. And wealth does not come from extraction, production, consumption. The only way that system is able to work is if you externalize pollution, climate change, poverty, war. It's not true. They're not external because you call them external. They are internal to the economy. And so it's not possible to, to see this system. If you put any one of those factors in, it's already bankrupt. So we need to understand this. Wealth comes from functional ecosystems. You're back in Ethiopia with them. They're very nice people, by the way, very hardworking. But everywhere in the world are people who are studying this. Restoration is an inevitable part of our future if we are to survive. If we don't care to survive and we just keep going in the way we're going, then we will end up like those other civilizations, like the Lus Plateau and all the other cradles of civilization. But there's nowhere to go. So we're not going to the Mars. We're not going somewhere else. We live on the Earth. And we're all related to each other. Now, this is an interesting place not, this is a Mediterranean biome. It's actually an Atlantic uh, part of Portugal, but it's a Mediterranean biome. And it's been drying up for quite a long time. And in Tamera, maybe some of you know the Tamera community, they decided that they would create a water retention landscape. They got Sepp Holzer, I don't know, an Austrian permaculturist, and he he told them how to do this. They were, they were kind of funny. They, they said, can we feed the people on our land? And he just laughed at them and said, what? no, no, because you don't know what you're doing. But if you knew what you were doing, it would be easy. And, uh, and then he, he got them started on this. And I'm, I'm, I think it's really good that they, they got this because they were kind of into a, a sort of psychoanalysis thing, which wasn't very productive. But going into, into ecology for them gave them, as a community, a purpose. And they're having a very good time. And the area is beautiful. And they're proving it's possible to rehydrate dehydrated biomes. And they're proving that even people from urban areas can learn how to do agriculture. And their children are really interesting. They look, they look at you. They always tell the truth. They're really interesting. They're not afraid. It's, it's beautiful. And they have really good food. Too. So I think these communities, communities are the way forward. We can't do this alone. No one can do this by themselves. Yeah, we have it's going to require lot of lots of people and working together. How much mangold? 16 kilos. Oh. And this one's... So we're really going to have to enjoy these things. I know that you already enjoy these things, so I put these pictures in because I thought this is my imagination of this community. And those are some proud chefs. He booked it. And some very good food.
So, I think it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale degraded ecosystems. I think that it's obvious to me that wealth comes from ecological function. I think that in that scenario, there is a role for everyone on the earth. It's possible to have equality to actually say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all human beings are created equal and mean it. And we're going to need many, many people. One of the things that I'm working on now is in Jordan. And this I would like to ask you to join in this work. Because what's happening now, I noticed 25 years ago. I mean, when you walk in the Middle East, everybody's saying the next war is about water. Simple, decentralized models can be a simple, can be a, a solution for our conflict and other conflicts in the world because it's all about living. I was looking for alternative for my life and for the life of my daughter. <laughs> Look here and when you walk and you see eatable uh, landscape, you walk and you eat. You, you have all what you need. You have your clean water, you have enough food, you have education, you have all what you need for life. Why to fight then? So. We're calling this Growing Peace Through Ecology. And we're creating a research, training, and innovation center for ecological restoration in Jordan. And the reason is because in October, I was looking at those Is Islamic State videos. And I wanted to not look at them. And I realized that I wasn't engaging with this, and I needed to. This is Jeff Loughton's center. So in 2009, he had just begun this. And if you saw my film that we did with him called Green Gold, um, it was in 2012. So this is 2010. Then, and this is a very tiny place, but 2011 and then 2012, or I think you're going to see 2013, so you don't see it when we're there, but you see it in 2013. So what's interesting is, in six years, you can close canopy in Jordan. So look at that. If we were to do that in a bigger area, we would be affecting the microclimates. And what, what I... So there may be hundreds or thousands of these people who are willing to go join the Islamic State, but there must be millions or billions of people who have really compassionate hearts and who prefer a nonviolent response and want to make something happen. This is an area that we've been given in Jordan. It's 15 hectares. It's, it's uh, 30 minutes from the airport in, near Amman. And it looks like that. And this, in the, the, the European, is Robert Simftleben. He's Danish. He's been there three times now. He's convinced his institution to give him his degree based on developing this project. We have uh, a number of other participatory groups who are working in this way. This is a Roman well on the property. Um, it's, we're planning to go to this area and use yurts, set up a yurt camp and have designers and people come and join with the local population to restore this area. And when we get water harvesting and propagation units in, we'll start to do earth architecture. 
to put in permanent facilities. And when the permanent facilities are in, the gears, the yurts, can go somewhere else and keep going. And here we can train hundreds and then thousands and maybe millions. We can train Palestinian refugees, Syrian refugees, Jordanians, and people from all over the world. Let's work together on this. Let's grow peace through ecology. And there's some emails. Write to us if you're interested. John Liu at eemp.org and Serene at mac.com. Thanks very much for listening to me.